Shall we read God's word together? Then we'll uh, concentrate and have a look at it afterwards. So we're in uh, 1 Kings, 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, very, very familiar. I would say if uh, you've read any of your Bible, you probably uh, know this story, uh, Elijah and the Mount Carmel victory. So it's chapter 18 of 1 Kings and verses 20 to 46. Perhaps you're going to read all that because you're so familiar with it, I guess. Uh, so Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. That's the prophets of uh, Asherah and um, Baal. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. It's strange, isn't it? Then Elisha said to the people, I alone am left, a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Don't forget that there was Asherah's uh, henchmen as well, uh, another 400, so it's 850 against one. But we'll find out that when God is in the camp, it's he that is in the main and not when it seems we're outnumbered. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore let them give us two bulls, and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood. Put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bull, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said to him, It is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first. For you are many and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. When I read this, I, I had a chuckle to myself. This, this is going to get hilarious. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name, uh, sorry, called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon. So they were at it all morning till noon. Yeah, it is. It's, it's amusing. But there was no voice. Surprise, surprise. No one answered. Then they leapt about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. Elijah is winding them up. So they cried aloud and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out to them. This is unbelievable, isn't it? Shouting, screaming, dancing, cutting, slashing. And guess what? Not a pip. Not a bean. And when midday was passed, they prophesied, and they prophesied until the time of the, of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. This is sad, isn't it? No one paid attention. Why? Because there was no one there. There was no one there. This is no contest. 850 against one seems overwhelming. There's no contest here. God is in the camp. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he, he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. That's sad as well, isn't it? They neglected the altar, so they had to rebuild it. And Elijah took 12 stones, you know that, one for each uh, of the tribes, the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. 
Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seers of seed. This was a big ditch. You didn't dig a little ditch around. He dug a ditch. John would know a different when you dig in the footings on heaven. He dug a ditch. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and he laid it on the wood and said, this again, this is amazing. Fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Now, we're not talking about, you're not talking like that. You're talking these huge things that they, that they use for washing and cleaning. Who knows how many gallons? <coughs> Chuck it on, he said. Chuck it all over it. Go on, do it again. Chuck it over a second time. Oh, go on, do it a third time. Chuck it all over it again. The trench was filled with water. This thing was saturated. There's no way you're going to light this. Even with zip fire light, there's us things not going to light. What happens? God came down. Verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. He missed out and of all the world. But there we are. <laughs> he knows what he was saying. He's a prophet of God. And I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw this, so it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And don't we echo that tonight? The Lord, he is God. He Amen. still is. He always was and always is. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Sad end to them, but... They wasted all the time. They probably would have bled to death anyway, the way they were kept on themselves, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Let the Lord bless the reading of his word and his understanding of the word. We were blessed yesterday with the wedding of Jamie. I, I don't know if you've met Jamie and, and uh, Stephanie. And uh, we would have prayed for a day like today, but it was wet. We were up on the mountainside, down in Mountain Ash there. And <clears throat> I thought, Lord, if you're going to give me uh, a confirmation of my sermon... Then he gave me a confirmation of my sermon because we were up on the mountainside. It was hammering down with rain. Looked down in the valley. Sometimes we couldn't, couldn't see our house because directly opposite is our house. And at times you couldn't see it and it lashed down. It was an arduous journey getting up to the farm. It's a horrible road. And I've got to be honest, I begrudged taking my car up there because we were bouncing up and down and it, it was crunching and... and so it was an arduous journey again, and we got to the mountain top, and it was a beautiful day. But sadly, we know that we would have to go back down again into the darkness and into the darkness. And it's a bit like our spiritual lives, isn't it? We get a mountain top experience, but then we got to face the valley. So the, my title this evening is From Mountain to Valley, or From Valley to Mountain. The Bible is laden with mountaintop experiences. Even Jesus in his time here was given a panoramic view of supernaturally of all the nations of the earth by the prince of this earth, Satan. He said, look at all these nations. If you bow down and worship me, then I'll give them all to you. Bit of a cheek, really, but he did have the right to say that because we had given him, man had given him that authority. Right at the beginning of Jesus' uh, ministry, this was said and done. And then also on a mountaintop, he was transfigured, wasn't he, before Peter, James, and John. Where? Up on top of an unnamed mountain. A mountaintop experience. And I suppose not to stretch a point too far, Jesus was led outside Jerusalem and he was crucified. Not on a mountaintop, maybe, but on a rugged hilltop. Moses had at least three mountaintop experiences. He was spoken to from the burning bush, you know, the bush that burned but didn't burn up. Moses. Moses. 
And then he went to the top of another mount. And then later the commandments were given to him. And finally he had a mountain top view of the promised land where he died. And God buried him. And there's also the great typological incident, of course, on Mount Moriah, where Abraham was challenged by God to sacrifice his precious son, Isaac, where we see the great doctrine of substitution typified so very, very clearly. They all experienced mountaintop experiences, but they also experienced valley experiences too. Even Jesus did. They are but few of more mem of the more memorable, shall we say, mountaintop experiences and valley experiences. But I'd like us to think briefly about another one that we just read about on Mount Carmel. It is, of course, the great challenge laid down by Elijah to the false prophets of Baal and Asherah. And I'm sure that you can see where I'm going with this purely uh, wonderful title of from mountain to valley or valley to mountain. Elijah was up against 850 probably men. We don't know, we're not told, but 400 of them were men. So we assume that they were all prophets that were men. And they challenged the truth of God. But if, as we've read, Elijah challenged God's people to return to him. They challenge, he challenged his, the people about their desertion to God and from God. Two altars were erected there then. And to be fair to Elijah, he said, oh, I'm going to be fair to you now. You choose the sacrifices. I'm not going to be biased here. You choose them. I'll give you that opportunity. And when you choose two of them, you can choose the one that you are going to use, and I'll use the other one. I think there's a bit of faith going on here, do you? I think we can feel the faith coming through here. So these false prophets, they dance, they shout, they scream, and to no avail. No one answered. There was nobody there. And then they resorted even further. They, they resorted to self-mutilation, as was their custom, which is weird, isn't it? So they started cutting themselves and screaming. and shouting. It must have been absolute bedlam. And you can imagine Elijah there just going, I don't believe this lot. But look at this lot for you. And you were following these? You were following these? And it's a question we I mean, keep in mind. They, these are We're talking about normal human being people, just like you and me. They had, they had witnessed and they, they, they had known a wonderful God and they're seeing all this trash going on and they're going after that. We've got to be careful in our lives that we don't go after trash, friends. We've got to be careful. So then, nothing happened. Everything was untouched. No fire, no anything. Then it was the turn of the man of God, Elijah. He had his sacrifice absolutely saturated. It couldn't have been any more wet. Dad would say that when we, when we baptized him. He couldn't go down into the pool, but we made sure he had lots of jugs of water over him. And he said, I was wetter coming out than she was wet in there. <laughs> Got to give him a good dunk, you know, now. It was brilliant. But it was absolutely saturated. And then the man of God called upon God and the fire came down from heaven. It licked up everything. The, the <laughs> sacrifice was gone. The, the altar was gone. The water that was around there was licked up. This firebolt from heaven incinerated everything. And people were just, they weren't, they were down on their faces because they knew there was a God in Israel. And he answered that word. The false prophets were then summarily executed and a wonderful victory was won. And if we read on a little further, there was, there was famine in the land. There, there was drought in the land, John. has experienced a little bit of the drought out in, out in Greece by the look of it. And at his word, there was drought. And now at his word, there would be rain again. 
Elijah, God's true prophet. So, after this wonderful victory, great public victory on the mountaintop of Carmel, one would think that Elijah, armed with this reassurance and evidence that God was with him in a most incredible and powerful way, that he would stand. But there was a, a death threat put forward, if we went on a little bit into, into 19. Jezebel, that, that uh, don't like to use that word, but she was a very nice person, shall we say, put out a fatwa on him. She said, I'm going to get you. I'm going to kill you. And you would have thought that after this, Elijah would have thought, oh, after that, nothing's going to faze me. I'm not afraid of any Jezebel. But what did he do? Look at verse 3. And when he saw that, when he heard that, he ran for his life. How very human. I'm glad that Elijah was human. I'm glad that it records this in scripture. Why do I know then that Elijah was a man just like us? Well, James, not my James now, the James in the scriptures, chapter 5 and verse 17 and 18 says this. If I put my markers in the right place. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced his fruit. I love that scripture. He was a man just like us. And don't think that's a sexist thing, because it's not. It's saying he was just a human person, and he can be used just like us. So you see, you don't have to be a special person with incredible skills and incredible talents to be, or, or, or a person of renown to be used effectively by God. He uses Joe Public, people like you and me. And all we have to do is be submissive, obedient, teachable, trusting, kind and loving even as the Lord Jesus Christ was and typified for us. And Elijah, even here. I'm not sure that Jesus would have run away, <laughs> but Elijah did. My point is that we all love the mountaintop experience, don't we? We all love to be on cloud night when everything is going wonderfully. We pray in, we get in answers to prayer. People are coming in. Things are wonderful within the family and in our friends. Everything is going wonderfully. But then, then comes the valley experience. And you know, just as we found it difficult going up to the wedding yesterday, it was really hard. It was raining. It wasn't very nice. And to say the road was horrible. And I said to Helen, I'm going to park halfway up and you're going to up. But I, she's not very well. So I said, oh, I'm going to go all the way. And I did. My car was grumbling. All the alarms were going off. There's something here, something beep, 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 beep. And, uh, but it was a wonderful time. We had a mountaintop experience, but we knew we had to go back down into the valley. And so do we. We can't physically live permanently on a mountaintop experience. We have to descend into the valley. Even physically, there's, there's no Tesco's or Asda's at Snowden, is there? You'd have to go down. So how did Elijah get to a place where his faith grew so much that a fireball from heaven came down in answer to prayer? It's obvious in his earlier experiences, he struggled to get up to the mountain top, had time with God, was strengthened there. And when he got down into the valley, <laughs> down into the valley where all these prophets were. He was strong then because he had learned before. And that's the same for us. Our learning goes on in the valley, not on the mountaintop. The mountaintop is a cherry on the cake, if you will. That wonderful experience with God, that, that feeling of, of, of fullness with God. 
But that's a preparation for the tough stuff that goes on in the valley. <laughs> it's incredible sometimes to stand on top of your mountain and look down, isn't it? Today would be fantastic, wouldn't it? But if you'd gone up there yesterday, you probably wouldn't have seen anything. So let's think then about the mountain top and the valley experiences in our lives. Let's apply them then in our lives. We may not be used to call down fire from heaven. But what, I'm, what, I, what I'd like to tell you is, don't discount it. Because if God's done it before, <laughs> God can do it again. It may not be as drastic as that, but be faithful in what he calls us to do. Why shouldn't the almighty, the all-powerful, and all-knowing and all-seeing God use you today? Why not? We all got to surrender. We've all got to be soft. We've all got to be playable so that he can use us. Let's apply it then. Firstly, I think we need to process the experience. When, when you have that wonderful experience, like, like man, you had that experience, didn't you? you, you you'd love to stay there, wouldn't you? But you can't. It'll go with you, and it will help you, but you cannot stay on top of that mountain. There's work that God wants you to do, and it gets messy. It gets messy. And we need to have that mountaintop experience behind us so we can face what it is that we have in the valley. We must ask some poignant questions when we have these experiences. Like I said, who has benefited through this experience that, I, that I've just gone through? Or who is going to experience uh, or, or benefit from this experience? Why was that grace afforded me? Or why was that grace afforded to that person in this situation? Is that, how is this going to help me in the future? How is this going to, to, to lead me to bigger and better things in the future? All we need to do is listen to what God is saying to us. And what is it that he is preparing us for? Romans 8, 28, Paul right into the church at Rome. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. We don't call ourselves. We don't put ourselves forward. We don't go on like maverick. We hear, we pray, then we go. Because we know this is what he is requiring us to do. Paul again wrote to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 1.27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. I'm so glad I read that on you. I'm, I'm no Superman, I'm no Elijah, but yes, I am. Yes, you are. But we've got to know it. <laughs> we've got to be in our place, haven't we? We don't demand of God, we hear from God, and then we put it forward. You know, there are many times when God will ask us to do something very odd. Something very strange. This was a bit strange, wasn't it? Go up against 850 people. Yeah. That's a bit odd. But God might ask us to do something very difficult as well. Might feel I'm not cut out for this. Who am I to do this? Just always remember, God said, I am always with you. Always with you. And he might ask us to do something very simple and something mundane. We jump at the big things. We're not so keen on the little things, are we? But do you know, somebody's got to do the teas. Somebody's got to do the toilets. 
Somebody's got to give those lifts. Somebody's got to do the worship. Do not despise the season of small things. Work at the things God has given us to do. And when the time is right, you will get more. So if you're not faithful in the little things, he's not going to give us something big. Yeah? If we haven't bothered going up that mountain to get to the mountain top, you're not going to get the blessing that's there. I would have missed half a blessing yesterday because I would have parked halfway up. Go all the way to the top. Get all the blessing and be prepared for when you come down into that valley experience. God knows the beginning and the end for he is Alpha and Omega. And if we desire to see an Elijah type result in our Christian experience, we have to walk the walk. It's no good just talking the talk. We've got to walk the walk. We've got to do the experience bit. There's no corner cutting with God. I wish there were. I wish I could tell you this is, this is a great shortcut. Take this one. Don't work like that with God. God will take us through things that we don't want to go through. He'll lead us to places we don't want to be, meeting people we don't want to be with. But he uses that unto always to our good. We've got to be patient and vigilant in the valley. Keen and eager when we go up. Pliable and listening and attentive when we're there. Because we go down much faster than when we come up. And we're going to hit that valley at the rate of knots. And we need to be prepared. Amen. Amen. Willing, keen, obedient and available. That's what Elijah was. And that's how we need to be. Secondly, there's the application of the experience. We need to apply that experience that God has given us. God doesn't bring us to a mountain top for us to write it in our journals or, or in, in our diary. He doesn't do that. You know, last, last week I went up the mountain. And I, he doesn't do that. What is he doing? He's getting him through a struggle to get there to teach you something so that when something's going to come down there, you know exactly what to say and what to do. If we ignore the mountaintop, if we ignore the instruction, we're going to struggle down there. We won't struggle there. It's great. It's wonderful. It's lovely. But the action is down here. And we've got to be prepared for that. Elijah was. Now, I'm not suggesting that we don't keep a diary or a journal, okay? Don't, be, don't think that now. But there must be this faith-building experience to bring about what God wants in us. You see, if we have uh, a small or, uh, say, an intermittent uh, view of God and, and what he can do and, and in us and, and what he can show us and everything, the output is going to be just as intermittent and small. You get that, don't you? Expect little, then that's what you're going to get. Pray big. Expect big things. It's not easy. It's tough. It's really tough. And I know you've gone, you've gone through hard things here, haven't you? But be faithful. That's what you're called to do, is be faithful. I went through it myself seven or eight years ago, and it's tough. But God is teaching us things all <laughs> the time. Galatians 6, 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. Do you get that? If you sow to your flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Is it any chocoholics here? If you want Mars bars, don't plant a Twix. Sounds silly, don't it? What you plant is what you're going to get out of it. <coughs> plant good things. Plant godly things. And who knows? Who knows where it'll take you? Do not despise the 
the season of small things. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 10. You see, many times God is teaching us something through very simple things. Simple circumstances. And we, being pious and righteous and holy, ignore it. And we're looking for the big thing that God wants to, wants to show us and teach us. So, no, 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 no. You're not getting it. If you're not going to get the little things, you're not going to get these big things. We miss a simple lesson. You know, God is our Father who's in heaven. And what father would seek to confuse or speak to his child in a way that the son or daughter can't understand? You know, my dad, my dad wouldn't, wouldn't explain something to me uh, in, in some huge, in the, all these posh words and everything. And I'm sitting there, I think, what is he on about? I don't understand. God is not going to do that to us. He wants the best for us. Let's not overcomplicate God. Yes, he's complicated. Yes, he's infinitely com complicated. <laughs> but we are simple. And he speaks to us in simple ways. Wisdom, knowledge, and discernment should be our A plus goals. Our A star goal. Our number one prayer should be for wisdom, knowledge, and discernment from heaven itself. The scripture says we don't have because we don't ask. Is it a case that we haven't done continually ask for these things? And be like that widow who went to the unjust judge. Keep asking, keep knocking, for surely God will give it to you. How can we, how can we waste wisdom, knowledge, and discernment if they are given to us as gifts? The only way you can, you, you can misuse that or whatever is not use it. Really, if you think about it, wisdom and all these things from God... You see, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But fear has nothing to do with terror. Oh, no, God. It's nothing to do with that. It's about reverence. It's about love. It's about respect for our God. Why should we do that? Because it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God, the scripture tells us. Dear friends, unconfessed sin cripples us as Christians. It cripples us. Let's be quick to forgive and quick to ask for repentance. But to the non-believer, it'll send them to a Christless eternity. You know, why do we put up with sin in our lives? We are to hate sin with a passion. You, you know it's okay to hate, don't you? I hope you know that. But it's hate in the right things. <laughs> Hating sin is absolutely wonderful for you. I condone it. Let's hate it with a passion. And get it out of our lives. Thirdly, we need to revisit that experience and question ourselves. The biggest question we can ask ourselves as a Christian is how am I doing? How am I doing after that wonderful mountain top or even dark deep valley experience? The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, chapter 2 and verses 12 to 16. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. Did you get that? Work out your own salvation. Doesn't mean that we get our own salvation. Salvation is from God. But we are to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in our salvation to grow. And to be like a light. Fire from heaven, O oh God. And it can happen. Paul wrote the Corinthian church in his second letter, chapter 13 and verse 5. He said this, Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Much the same message, isn't it? 
Self-examination is healthy, friends. It is healthy. It's not easy, and sometimes it's not very comfortable. But it's necessary. It's necessary. And it's really an obligation for us as a Christian. How do we grow if we don't have a little conflab with ourselves? Oh, we're doing today. Uh, oh, I wasn't very good then. Is it? No, that wasn't good. Sort it out then. Yeah, you're right. Let's sort it out. Some silly, doesn't it? But it's good. It's good stuff. Sometimes we need to put on the brakes. Look around. Where, where am I? How is this going? How far have I come? How far have I yet got to go? And put a plan into place with Holy Spirit, with prayer, with consideration. You know, when, <clears throat> when we were younger and we were considering what we would do as a vocation, what we would do as a job, whatever, it doesn't matter whether, whether it was highly skilled or whether it was laboring or something, what did we have to have? We had to have a mentor. We had to go to someone to show us the ropes. What to do, and most importantly, what not to do. <laughs> it's the same in our spiritual walks. The Holy Spirit has been given to help us in our walks. Why listen to anyone else? Why even listen to yourself? When we have the chief artisan there. Not just with us, but in us. Sometimes we need to lay a certain problem down. We may need to try and park it there, go away, Quiet room, Lord, what have I got to do about this? How am I going to overcome this? What can be done in this? And then we have to go back and then we have to revisit it with a clearer mind, with instruction from God, maybe with a different approach to it. You know, sometimes we go about like a hamster in a spinning wheel. We can't get off. And we think the faster we go, we're going to get out. Instead of slamming the brakes on and just stepping out. It's a bit like that when we don't listen to God. We don't listen to the Holy Spirit. We don't listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're on a wheel and we can't get off. Slam the brakes on. Let's get out. Let's get in the prayer room. And let's meet with him and talk with him. You see, the, the scriptures have been written by men, yes, but the inspiration of the blessed Holy Spirit. It's indispensable. If we do away, do away with this, we may as well throw the towel in. We're going to get nowhere without this. If we go and, and, and not make reference and take our instruction and lead from you, we're on a loser. We're on a loser, friends. The scriptures are here for doctrine. Reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. For what purpose? So that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Again by James. And again, not my James. And again, not sexist. This is for mankind. Man and woman. Goes on further. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. It's like uh, reading. Yeah, da, 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 da. yeah, right. Okay. And don't look at it again until we do the same thing tomorrow. That's not reading your scriptures. I'm talking to myself now. We must measure all things by scripture. All things. No matter how big, no matter how small, never, no matter if you're going up the hill, no matter if you're on top of there, no matter if you're going down the hill, no matter if you're in a valley, Scripture rules everywhere. Scripture is available to us. And we must learn to apply it thoroughly in our lives. I'm so encouraged that the Bible shows us what not to do 
as well as those things that we should be doing also. I'm glad that James, the brother of Jesus, said that Elijah was a man just like us, aren't you? We can take great encouragement, you see, from Elijah's failings as well as his great victories. I wonder, did you, did you luxuriate in that mountaintop experience, but then miss the running away like a scary cat? I've done, I've done that. I'm all up for that mountaintop experience, but when the rubber hits the road, by let's not be scary cats. But there are times when we do need to step away, pray, consider, get back to it, and confront. But God will lead us in these things. We can see human frailty in Elijah, which is good, because there's hope for us. If there was only these mountaintop experiences in all these wonderful men and women of God, we would feel inferior, wouldn't we? If I wrote scripture, I wouldn't include the bit where David committed adultery with Bathsheba. And I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't include that he tried to cover her up and then had him murdered in battle. I certainly wouldn't include them. But they're there. Why? To show us how not to do it. And then... We are shown how to do it. That wasn't the, ele- the end for Elijah, was it? There was miracles and miracles. And then he passed the baton on to Elisha. You know, don't get discouraged. That's, that's, that's what I want us to Let's not get discouraged when things get hard. What do we do? Well, Ask some, ask some serious questions. What happened? How does this relate to my situation? How am I going to proceed? How am I going to live out that experience? And you know, I think a wonderful thing to do is get a little hub of praying people around you. Intercession intercessory friends are like precious nuggets of gold and precious stones because there is there are times when we can't do this on our own with God sometimes we need that human touch with us and around us we are built for flock we built for flock and together we are strong we've all got different gifts And when those gifts come together and they work in together, it's strong, it's powerful. You know, I'm not saying that we can't do things on our own, but when we're together and of one mind, in unity, larger things happen. Collect godly people. Pray, pray. And then pray again. Ecclesiastes 4.12, nearly finished. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a three-core. A three-fold cord is not quickly broken. And Psalm 131, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. What a wonderful word that is. Unity. And sisters, of course, must remain politically correct. So then, let us go prayerfully on to the next mountaintop experience. And let's prepare there for the next valley experience. Because as sure as eggs is eggs, it's going to come. If you can't be bothered to get up to the top, then we're in for a torrid time. But on the top, we can soak, we can prepare. You know, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit like when you're thinking about the, the Roman soldier and he's pouring his, pouring his whole armour on, preparing for battle, getting his mind 
ready and strengthened. That's what it's about. It's preparing for that valley experience. Forewarned is forearmed, we are told. And that's, there's a lot of truth in that, isn't there? So let us resolve then to walk circumspectly with the Holy Spirit in these ever darkening days. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil, for thou God Almighty is with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He'll be with us till the end of the age. He will not leave us as orphans. He will lead us upward. He will prepare us thereon. And he will take us down. And he will guide us and keep us and make us victorious in that valley experience. May God bless us. As we go on in these coming days, weeks and months. I don't think we've got years. Last for another time, maybe. Would you like me to close? Or Father, we bless you and praise you and thank you for this time. We thank you that you've inhabited the praise and worship of your people. Lord, will you take us? Will you lead us and will you guide us in all spirit and in truth that we might glorify you and the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, that we might be able to witness and testify powerfully of you and of Jesus. That we will see, Lord, things change in this valley. That, Lord, the, the houses that are remaining faithful will see increase and growth. I pray that this house, Lord, will find the bridge from, the, from these uh, youngsters groups, Lord, into, into the church, plus the parents as well, Lord. That's a difficult bridge, but Lord, this was a difficult thing that Elijah found. And you came down in a thunderbolt from heaven, and I pray that this house will have thunderbolts from heaven and that they won't be able to contain the blessing. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.